Mr. We're Farina? Here, what go, do you go, want go, me? go, go, go. You don't have any enzymes because you couldn't make them here. You couldn't make them there. No enzymes, you're lost. That lovely, soft-spoken human being was Dr. James Tour, a professor of chemistry at Rice University who recently engaged in a, well, shall we say, vibrant debate with YouTuber Professor Dave Explains on the topic of abiogenesis. Uh, you saw a little bit about how it went. Dr. Tour also has a popular YouTube channel, just like Dave, where he spends the majority of his time criticizing abiogenesis, that is, the scientific hypotheses for the origin of life on Earth. Now, I attended this debate live. Here I am asking Dr. Tour a question. Uh, Dr. Tour, it seems like most of your critiques rest on so far unjustified assumptions, so I would like to give you the opportunity here to justify at least one of those assumptions. Now, before we can get to the specifics of my question for Dr. Tour and his horrendous answer to that question, we need to set up a little bit of background to understand just the nature of Dr. Tour's criticisms of abiogenesis. Let's look at Dr. Tour's first line of argumentation, namely that we are clueless about the prebiotic formation of polypeptides. I'll let Dr. Tour explain. This dipeptide is one of thousands and thousands and thousands that would have to form. If you were going to make a polypeptide, you'd need at least 100 of these for a very small polypeptide. <clears throat> Mr. Farina, show me the prebiotic chemistry that would do this coupling. Be my guest. What you have to be able to do is show me chemistry. I'm asking you specifically for chemistry, yep. not a bunch of nonsense here. Show me the chemistry. No. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, we, we, we can do that. Uh, here's the chemistry, Dr. Tor. Here is the chemistry showing the prebiotic formation of peptide bonds in aqueous solution without protecting agents. It's mediated by a molecule called carbonyl sulfide, which is a naturally occurring volcanic gas, which is completely prebiotically relevant. So here's, here's the chemistry that Dr. Tour was making such a big stink about. Now, if Dr. Tour was watching this video, he would then come back and say, ah, da, 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 da. That's not showing the peptide bonds for these very specific amino acids that he was talking about. See, he was talking about forming a peptide bond between lysine and aspartic acid, two of the 20 types of amino acids. Remember that amino acids come together and form polypeptides. And when you have a long enough polypeptide, we call that a protein. All proteins are fundamentally made up of chains of these amino acids, and there are 20 types of amino acids. Now, here's the key thing to understand about Dr. Tor's criticism here. You see, he understands this chemistry with carbonyl sulfide. I, for one, have sent him the paper months ago, back in January. I emailed him a paper showing this exact chemistry. So he's very well aware of it. And you know what he responded to me? The, the same thing that he brought up with Professor Dave. He said, oh, well, that's all well and good for half of the amino acids, the ones that don't have very reactive side chains, but you can't explain the, the, how you form peptide bonds if the two amino acids have highly reactive side chains. Um, okay, but he doesn't ever stop to question uh, whether or not that would even be necessary to do in the first place. I'll explain. Dr. Tour is under the assumption that in order to have a working model of abiogenesis, you need to start with all 20 amino acids forming peptide bonds. For some reason, he is under this assumption. Now, he never justifies why he thinks that this needs to be the case. He never even mentions it. It is a tacit assumption in his presentation, but it's worth analyzing it about whether or not this would even truly be the case. Here is the paper that I provided Dr. Tour, Greenwald et al. from 2016, showing that you can have prebiotically relevant synthesis of peptide bonds. This paper specifically only examines about four of the amino acids, but uh, again, that is besides the point. 
Dr. Tour's criticism was that we are clueless about prebiotic peptide bond formation. Remember, Dr. Tour is saying, well, you need all 20 amino acids. You need to be able to form peptide bonds between amino acids with highly reactive side chains. But he never says why. Why, Dr. Tour, why do we need to form a lysine and aspartic acid bond? He never explains why. It's true that all life today uses the same t set of 20 amino acids, but that really only would tell us information about the last universal an common ancestor for life today. It doesn't tell us anything about what it would be like at the origin of life itself. And to think that it does is logically fallacious. There is no sufficient reason to think that all 20 of these amino acids and would be necessary at the very origin of life. And there is no good, compelling reason to think that the premise that we need to be able to explain the formation of a dipeptide bond between lysine and aspartic acid is necessary at all. And the entire time that Dr. Tour spends focusing on these two specific amino acids and this specific peptide bond formation is simply a distraction from the larger point, which he has already acknowledged both in my email to him and during this debate with Dr. Dave that in fact, we can explain the mechanism of a prebiotic formation of peptide bonds using carbonyl sulfide, a volcanic gas that is prebiotically relevant. So therefore, his first criticism that we are clueless about peptide bond formation is completely baseless. We do have lots of clues about how this could form and what potential mechanisms would explain it. Now, Dr. Tour wants to focus on the fact that these mechanisms do not explain all 20 amino acids and only explain the amino acids that do not have highly reactive side chains. But here is the flaw in that reasoning. In order to do this biologically, not prebiotically, but biologically, you have to use an enzyme that has about a thousand, about a, a, a thousand amino acids in it. So the probability of that forming randomly would be 20 to the thousandth. I mean, it's, it's just a crazy big number. If something's bigger than 10 to the 50th, you don't have enough time in the universe. Here you wouldn't have enough time in a billion, billion, billion universes. Is there any chemistry that you can show me that's prebiotically relevant that would do this coupling? And you will say, oh, I argue that only enzymes can do this. You don't have any enzymes because you couldn't make them here. You couldn't make them there. No enzymes. You're lost. You don't, we already established you don't have enzymes. There's no enzymes yet Shouting on the prebiotic totally earth. You couldn't make them. You're clueless on that. Okay, time, okay, is, well, time is up. And this is Tour's key argument and his most critical mistake. He thinks, on top of needing all 20 of the original amino acids, he thinks that we need the modern enzymes that we have in our bodies today in order to have life. He thinks that in order for abiogenesis to happen, you have to have all 20 amino acids coming together at random and forming fully functional modern enzymes. Of course, this is a completely ridiculous straw man of what the science of abiogenesis actually shows. And this is why Dr. Tor's math is fundamentally wrong. Because he is calculating the odds that if we just have you know, millions of amino acids floating around in aqueous solution, all 20 varieties, he's saying that the odds of them all coming together and forming a polypeptide in the exact sequence necessary to form a functional enzyme is, you know, one in a hundred trillion or whatever large number he keeps throwing out there. But the entire premise that he is relying upon in order to structure these calculations is flawed and incorrect. You do not need a specific sequence of amino acids, hundreds of polypeptides long, with all 20 amino acids in order to form functional enzymes. This is simply incorrect, and this 
above all, is Dr. Tour's largest mistake. To back up what I'm talking about, let's look at a few papers on amyloids, specifically ones that show that you can form amyloids using prebiotic mechanisms like we saw earlier with less than half of the amino acids. Remember, Dr. Tour says, oh, well, you only have half the amino acids, so you're clueless and you fail. Well, hold on, James, because there are studies showing that just using seven of the 20 amino acids that you can actually form using prebiotic chemistry, very long amyloid proteins that do exhibit catalytic function. So you do not need to calculate the odds of randomly happening upon a very specific sequence of amino acids. This is unnecessary. The premise is false. Dr. Tour's math is wrong. Amyloids form naturally and spontaneously in the presence of carbonyl sulfide, and these amyloids exhibit catalytic functionality. Now, with that necessary context, let's return to the question I asked Dr. Tour, and let's see what his response is. Uh, Dr. Tour, it seems like most of your critiques rest on so far unjustified assumptions, so I would like to give you the opportunity here to justify at least one of those assumptions. The very first one, your very first question to Dave, seems like you admit that you can form peptide bonds for some of the amino acids in aqueous solutions without, un without protecting groups. You point out specifically lysine and arginine, and I would like to ask, why are you assuming that lysine and arginine and all 20 amino acids were there from the very first, the origin of life? Uh, yeah, could you just justify that assumption for us? Why couldn't you have life from, like, just some of the amino acids that later it's been on... 30 seconds. All 20? Okay, there so, so, my contest on the amino acid claims was he kept saying amino acids are simple to make in water. That's what he said in his series. But then, when challenged on that, he came out later and he said, when activated. When you activate them, they go from being zwitterionic to being non-zwitterionic. This is what I was getting at. So somebody coached him on this. Tour must be right in when, on the activation. Now, to your next question. Okay, let's just stop there and get this out of the way really quick. A zwitterion is just a molecule that has multiple positive and negative charges within the same molecule, right? He's saying that the big issue with these amino acids like lysine and aspartic acid is that there are multiple highly reactive parts of these molecules, highly reactive charged parts of these molecules. And he's saying that in order to get the peptide bond forming, when you have these highly reactive side chains, you need to activate them to make them non zwitterionic You need to get rid of all those excess highly reactive charges, and you need to focus on just having the chemistry that you want to get the peptide bond to form. That's what he means by activation, making them non zwitterionic as in, you know, you, you are getting the charge away from those highly reactive side chains so that they're not so highly reactive anymore, and that you can form the peptide bond properly. That's all he's talking about right there. So if you'll notice, had absolutely nothing to do with the question that I asked him, and it doesn't help him answer that question at all. Let's go on. Now, to your next question. Could there have been life with half of the amino acids? We have no idea. Even with half, even if I gave you half of the amino acid, now what? Now what? So what? Um, James, the, the so what is that if you have only the amino acids that are lacking those highly reactive side chains that are known to undergo polypeptide bond formation in aqueous prebiotic solutions, like we've already demonstrated, they're going to form amyloids. Amyloids are catalytic and are, ca are capable of self-replication. So if you've got self-replicating amyloids that are capable of catalyzing other reactions, such as the formation of the other 20 amino acids, then you have all the, the steps necessary in order for natural selection to kick in. And the origin of life, James, that's the so what. Now what? Now what? Be let me tell you, because if you have 100 amino acids, the chances of getting anything with prescribed information is 
is, say you have half the mean, it's 10 to the 100th. <clears throat> yes, it is. Now, let me, now, the chances of that folding, a 100 mer, the chances of it folding are what? 10 to the 90. All right, all right. Okay. So, so Leventhal, no, par time, Leventhal time Paradox. What so one, one form, one form. But Levin, Leventhal Ooh, Paradox. No way, no James, way. Get the vast majority door. do not fold. Time is up they for don't that fold. question. Next question on this side. So they cut my mic off there. So you can't actually hear my response, but I very blatantly call out James that, and I shout, that's not true. James, for the exact reason that we've gone over already. You do not need an exact amino acid sequence to form a functional catalytic enzyme. And amyloids demonstrate this. That's what I was trying to make known to James to point out the fact that his answer is relying upon unfounded assumptions and incorrect understandings of what the mathematics involved actually is. But I really want to draw your attention to the actual substance of James's response. Remember, I asked him to justify his assumptions that were inherent in his criticism. Did you hear any justification for that assumption? No, not even remotely close. He's, he said, uh, could you have had the origin of life with only half the amino acid? We have no idea. There it is. That was actually his answer to my question. I asked him to justify his assumption that you need all 20 amino acids. What was his justification? He just said, we have no clue if you needed all 20 amino acids at the beginning, or if you could have gotten by with less, he's got no idea. So then why, James, why are you assuming that you have to have lysine and aspartic acid from the very beginning? He has no reason. He has no justification for that assumption. And if there, that assumption, which is the basis of his criticism, is baseless, then his entire criticism is baseless. So, no, James, that to what you said about you don't have the enzymes, you don't have the enzymes. Well, no, James, we do have the enzymes. I just showed you the chemistry involved that shows us how we can get polypeptide bonds forming catalytically functional enzymes. They're called amyloids. You don't need a specific sequence. You don't need to, these statistics of one in a hundred trillion billion or whatever. That math does not apply. We've shown it. We've formed amyloids in only prebiotically relevant chemistry. So there you go. Step one, he says, is polypeptides. Step two, he says, you need nucleotides. Okay. And then he says, oh, how do you have the specific conformation of the nucleotides? Show me the chemistry involved in that. Well, guess what, James? It's enzymes. It's enzymatically catalyzed. When you have enzymes, remember the very first step, all of his criticisms rely on not being able to form enzymes. Literally his entire argument is all reliant upon not being able to form catalytically relevant enzymes. Only enzymes can do this. You don't have any enzymes because you couldn't make them here. You couldn't make them there. No enzymes. Which we just showed you can form catalytically relevant enzymes with less than half of all of the amino acids. So his entire argument falls flat on its face. Once you have enzymes, those can catalyze the formation of nucleotides. Once you have enzymes, those can catalyze the formation of polysaccharides. This last point is that how do you have specified information, right? Where does the specified information come from, Mr. Farina? Where does it come from? Tell us. Here, take the chalk. Write it for us. So let's answer that. Amyloids, for example, do contain information. And it, he is correct in the debate where he states that it's Shannon information. It's essentially a randomized information that's coming from the environment and the way that the amyloid was formed. Okay, all very well and good. But if each one of these amyloids that it forms is going to have slightly different compositions, those different compositions are going to impact the catalytic activity. Some amyloids will have superior catalytic functionality compared to others. And thus, natural selection kicks in. And we actually would have the 
selection pressure for the amyloids that are able to replicate the fastest. We would also have a selection pressure for the amyloids that are able to catalyze the formation of their own building blocks, such as those other 20 amino acids. So we have selection pressures that are that are refining the composition of the amyloid populations, okay? And the fidelity of amyloid replication is not exact. So you have this sort of mutation aspect as well. So you have all of these steps for natural selection, which is what takes this randomized information at the start and begins to produce specified information after round after round of natural selection. So that's how you have specified information. So every single one of James's critiques from the cluelessness of how you form polypeptides to the cluelessness of where you get specified information is all answered. And the basis of his critiques was fundamentally based on unjustified assumptions that James admitted he cannot justify. I mean, you Done. can say that. Done. You can't do this. You can't make you a can cell. You that, can't do you can that. Cheer, you can't make a cell. You're it's lying. over, buddy. It's over. Now, there is a lot more that I could say about this debate. I mean, most of it was focused on, like, he said, she said, you lied about this, you construed this incorrectly, and, you know, it went off the rails. It was a total shit show. Very entertaining. But what I've explained in the video completely dismantles the fundamental basis of all of James's criticisms, at least the ones that he presented at this debate. So, sorry, James. You're done. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I mean, I, I, yeah. People think that because James Tour is a PhD, because he's a chemist, the things that he's saying must have scientific merit. But as we've shown tonight, they do not. And James knows that they do not, or else he would publish them. And he explicitly addressed this in the debate. He said that he doesn't want to try to talk about this with actual scientists. He doesn't actually want to engage in the science and he doesn't want to contribute to the field of abiogenesis. He doesn't want his criticisms to be discussed in the field. He only wants to reach a public lay audience. He wants to bring up these criticisms to people that don't know any better. He wants to fundamentally sow doubt in people's minds about the science of abiogenesis, people who otherwise wouldn't know about the subject. This is James' entire MO behind his YouTube channel. It's very hard for me to publish a critique that is negative because it has to get through peer review. I am not trying to reach the origin of life researchers. I am trying to reach the masses. I am going after the people that do not read the scientific literature. That, to me, is what I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, you done. can say that. Done. It's, it's over, buddy. It's over.